uh, college lecture. So this we are doing this time in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the speaker, Dr. Chamindi Jayasundara. She's an acting consultant clinical hematologist, DGH Vaunia. So her topic is living with low platelet beyond steroid, a case-based discussion. Over to you, Dr. Jayasundara. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. So um, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I would first of all like to thank the Sri Lanka College of Physicians on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists for giving us this valuable opportunity. I would like to welcome you all uh, to a session on hematology, uh, thought of discussing uh, about a patient, a case-based discussion, living with low platelets beyond steroids. No conflicts of interest. So uh, this is regarding a patient, a young lady whom I met during my overseas training in the UK. Uh, she has a long clinical history. Um, the history goes back to uh, 2010. I will call her by the name Zara uh, for the ease of discussion. Um, so Zara was 18 years of age at uh, 2010. The, uh, how everything started was Sarah developed few echematic patches and a full blood count was done as the first line investigation by her GP. And a platelet count of 15,000 uh, was a cause of alarm for the patient and the GP. Therefore, ad advised to admit immediately through with the A&E, she was admitted to the medical casualty ward. Uh, at the time of admission, she had some mucocutaneous deeds, petechiae, and an echematic patch, but did not have any other significant deeds. Therefore, the bleeding was predominantly mucocutaneous. I believe uh, you all, uh, in your daily practice, would meet patients like Zara, who would come with mild bleeding and severe thrombocytopenia. A full blood count uh, repeated after admission showed HB of 102, uh, hypochromic microcytic indices, WBC count indices totally normal, platelets 15,000 with the increased MPV or the mean platelet volume was high. Blood picture eventually done showed mild hypochromic microcytic anemia uh, with severe thrombocytopenia. A point to remember when you meet patients like this, uh, a patient coming with a severe thrombocytopenia, uh, always the first thing to see the bleeding phenotype. Uh, might be a bleeder, might not be a bleeder. Uh, a thing to remember if the patient does not have a bleeding phenotype, a thing called pseudothrombocytopenia, you all might be aware. Uh, that is uh, an in vitro phenomenon where there can be platelet clumping in your, your EDTA blood sample causing a pseudo or falsely low thrombocytopenia as a in vitro phenomenon. So always uh, better to repeat a full blood count, make sure it is a definite thrombocytopenia and request a blood picture. And if your full blood count shows the platelet histogram, just have a look at these histograms. Uh, usually a normal platelet histogram will show a smooth curve like this. Whereas when there are large platelets or uh, like big plated clumps in the sample, you might see a non-smooth uh, rag uh, uh, like appearance uh, histogram where you won't get the uh, histogram returning to the baseline. This is just a point which might be valuable in your daily practice. So coming back to the patient, Zara, who came with a marked thrombocytopenia and a bleeding phenotype, when you meet this type of a patient in your OPD or um, daily clinical practice, a uh, few things uh, which you might uh, need to consider. What sort of a bleeding disorder does this patient have? Is it significant? Is it just a mucocutaneous or any sinister bleeding, GI bleeding or intracranial bleeding? Is the patient well or ill, febrile or not febrile? the differential diagnosis would totally change. In our setting, dengue would be high up in a uh, thrombocytopenic with a febrile illness. 
also viral infection and in the back of our mind we will keep the hematological malignancies in an ill or febrile patient. The duration of thrombocytopenia, whether it's an acute or a chronic thing. The drug history, has there been any heparin exposure within the past three months, any offending medication, any offending vaccinations, and also always ask whether the platelet, patient on antiplatelets or anticoagulant, it is important that we stop these then and there. Are there risk of uh, viral infections or is there a possibility of liver disease, connective tissue disease, family history of thrombocytopenia, whether this patient is a bleeder and a thrombocytopenic since the childhood. I'm sure you all generally uh, go through this type of a algorithm. Um, then uh, examination wise, focusing on fever or not, ill or well, bleeding sites, just to mark what sort of a bleeding uh, tendency, look for the sinister features like lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, pallorcteris, etc. Coming back uh, to Zara, my friend during my foreign training, uh, virology investigations were done then, which were all negative. Ultrasound scan, abdomen, liver showed normal architecture, no hepatosplenomegaly, no lymphadenopathy, liver profile normal, ANA negative. Uh, only thing to find was a low serum ferritin, uh, which indicated iron deficiency anemia, probably due to the thrombocytopenia and long-term menorrhagia, which was later discussed, discovered on further questioning. So um, uh, when there's isolated thrombocytopenia, just few things to work out, whether it's the increased consumption, it could be a commonest cause like immunological or non-immune causes, can there be a bone marrow pathology? Is there a massive spleen causing tooling? Uh, has there been a massive transfusion, a dilutional kind of thrombocytopenia? Has there been a liver disease? Usually the bleeding type are predominantly mu mucocutaneous in thrombocytopenias as well as in platelet functional disorders. Uh, out of the immune causes, whether it's a primary immune or secondary immune, the reason why to find the the secondary immune causes are the reason why we ask all those questions and do those all those investigations, um, which I previously mentioned, to rule out the infections, certain drugs, autoimmune disorders, or lymphoma-like diseases. Um, and also there are non-immune causes like DIC, TTP, or HUS. Of course, they will have their uh, other clinical features. Uh, coming back to the patient whom I'm discussing today, she did not have any sinister features in her history, examination, or investigations. Therefore, the conclusion, an 18-year-old young lady coming in iron deficiency, severe thrombocytopenia, depending on all these clinical and hematological parameters, a diagnosis of ITP was made, that is, uh, immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Remember, ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion, a perfectly well patient uh, coming with a severe thrombocytopenia. Once others are excluded, we can diagnose. What did we do at that time? Uh, prednisolone high dose given, two milligram per kg, seven days. Fortunately, platelets went up from 15 to 36. Did they give IV immunoglobulin or did they transfuse platelets? Did they do a bone marrow biopsy? No is the answer to all these questions. Um, they were able to maintain platelets above 30,000 in a safe level, and she did not have bleeding afterwards. Therefore, a uh, clinic follow-up with watch and wait policy maintained, prednisolone was tapered down. I would like you to refer you to this guideline, uh, I'm a, a ASH guideline, American Society of Hematology 2019 guideline, which is kind of the latest available, uh, which we can follow uh, during managing such patients. Uh, take quoting from the guideline, few things. Uh, when you meet a patient uh, similar in your daily clinical practice, the patient is not bleeding, coming with a very low platelet count, should you admit or sh you should not. If it is an acute presentation, even if the patient is not having bleeding symptoms, they advise to admit patients if the platelets are less than 20,000. But uh, maybe you will have to admit in a, at higher levels if the bleeding tendency is higher. Say patients on antiplatelets, anticoagulants, or uh, uremic patient, elderly patient, who you the patient might be at increased bleeding risk, the cutoff might be higher. 
uh, newly diagnosed yeah, ITP patients should we start on steroids or not? The recommendation is when the platelets drop below 30,000, uh, you should start on steroids rather than uh, adopting our channel policy. But if again, uh, the bleeding risk is higher, like uh, the elderly age over 60, the recommendation would be at higher cutoff. The physician or the treating hematologist, they can decide upon the uh, a point at which you uh, commence your steroids. Uh, so the initial treatment was with the, the recommendation, the corticosteroids, the prednisolone or the dexamethasone. Dexamethasone gives a faster response than the prednisolone. What sort of a duration? Uh, short courses are the recommendation because of the side effects of the steroids. They recommend to taper along a period of six weeks rather than continuing for a long term. Few don'ts or uh, what are the things we should practice when we are dealing with such patients? I know it's a scare when a young patients come with severe thrombocytopenia with a bleeding phenotype. Should we go ahead straight away and give immunoglobulin? Remember, it's very, very costly. And the bleeding tendency in ITP is not that high because we say the remaining platelets are functionally good. Therefore, unless there is a significant bleeding, uh, they do not uh, suggest to give uh, uh, IV immunoglobulin, even if the platelet count is less than 10. So the recommendation is if the patient is having significant bleeding uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, significant bleeding for us to con consider immunoglobulin, not just having a low platelet with a mucocutaneous bleed. Is there a point in transfusing platelets? Uh, unless, again, uh, there's a significant bleed, it's, there's no point because the platelets are short-lived because of the antibodies, the transfused platelets will also get um, broken down or there won't be any point in giving platelets. Uh, you will notice again, the counts will be, if it, the count was three and you are transfusing, you won't get increment. Uh, indication for a bone marrow biopsy. Look for atypical features, atypical clinical features or atypical laboratory features. If there's Atypical features, bone pain, ill pain, ill patient, organomegaly, lymphadenopathy, suspicious full blood count, blood picture, then we decide to do a bone marrow biopsy. Earlier, uh, it was thought that if the patient is above 60, definitely we should do a marrow even if there are no atypical features. Now, again, it's different. Uh, they say it's not really needed. So coming back to the patient, Zara was managed with the watch and wait policy for two years. Uh, she was fortunate to maintain platelets at a safe level, 40 to 60. We never try to normalize the platelet count. We just want a safe level. Uh, therefore, it was possible for uh, two years with brief courses of corticosteroids whenever she had a bleeding episode. Later, she was becoming corticosteroid dependent, had to maintain a uh, steroid dose above five, and she was showing so many side effects. Therefore, need of a second line treatment was there. Uh, why? Uh, because we all know uh, that uh, steroids are causing so much of side effects, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, hirsutism, low mood, osteoporosis, gastric issues, maybe only a few of them. Uh, now, these are challenges. Do we maintain them with low platelet counts without giving anything or do we keep on giving the steroids? Uh, unlike in the acute situation, when in the chronic situation or persistent or chronic ITP patient, at that time, the treating um, clinician should identify the bleeding phenotype of the patient. Even if the platelet counts are very low, we really do not need to go ahead and give uh, medication unless the patient is bleeding. Consider the side effect always and uh, clinical judgment would be the main strain managing. So when we are thinking of the second line, what are the available second line options? Uh, thrombopoietin receptor agonists, two types, romiplostin and L-thrombopath, rituximab and splenectomy. How do we choose one over the other? An individualized approach again, a discussion, uh, treating a hematologist or the clinician together with the patient and the family 
you look for certain things. Uh, Thrombocytin receptor agonists are very convenient, but very costly and may not be available. Uh, rituximab may be available in our setting, but it's a weekly for infusions, and there will be a prolonged immunosuppression uh, and splenectomy. It's a sur surgical option where we usually do not take this option until more than one year after diagnosis because within the first one year there's a possibility of spontaneous remission of the disease we do not want to give a long-term uh, side effect or a complication by taking off the spleen, spleen because they will need all the prophylaxis and uh, the risk of capsule infection by capsulated organisms uh, and surgical complications therefore usually spleenectomy avoided until uh, after one year since diagnosis. Uh, so um, Zara was commenced on second line. At that point, TPO agonist, uh, thrombocoistine receptor agonists were not available. Therefore, she was commenced on rituximab. Uh, what sort of a response will rituximab have? Usually about 40% will have a durable response, which might be lasting until about uh, two to five years. But her response was very short-lived. She achieved a platelet count of 166,000, which again dropped to very low levels. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, uh, the response lasts only a few months. Uh, uh, so uh, one thing, uh, she, as, as a child, she was diagnosed of having tetralogy of pylori. She was under follow-up by the cardiology and the cardiothoracic surgeons. By around this time, uh, the, she had a tetra, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, and uh, this was uh, uh, now there, it's a point where the cardiothoracic surgeon has uh, advised to go, go for an urgent cardiac surgery, a tricuspid valve replacement. How do we do this in a patient with a 14,000 platelets? Her platelets were back to 14,000 now. So many challenges for us. At that point, uh, her HB uh, preoperative optimization of hemoglobin and platelets was needed. And postoperatively, when we put a valve, we need to anticoagulate. And for anticoagulation, need a platelet count above 50,000. How to achieve this in this kind of a patient? Um, hemoglobin was optimized initially. Her iron deficiency was corrected by this time. Uh, but, so what are the targets we need to maintain? A uh, target of platelet 50,000 is needed for major surgery and again for general anesthesia as well. Postoperatively, uh, when we put a bioprosthetic valve, we need to give anticoagulation for three months. For that also, we need to maintain platelets above uh, 50,000. So a multidisciplinary approach taken, uh, everyone involved got together, the cardiothoracic surgeons, the cardiologist, the physician, hematologist, anesthetist, the clinical nurse specialist, who plays a vital role there, uh, the CNS in the cardiology, as well as the hematology, everyone uh, had a discussion with the patient, with the family, doc careful documentation of all the um, things, counseling done, and uh, the documents well comprehensively maintained. These are the good points we can take into our practice as well. The uh, discussions, the documentation, um, and involvement of all the uh, teams. So um, uh, at that time, a bioprosthetic valve was planned. Preoperatively, we have to optimize the platelet count. IV immunoglobulin given uh, to the doses, excuse me, and then uh, was able to achieve a platelet count, 118,000 steroids also commenced once again. Sarah underwent the surgery and uh, afterwards uh, continued the warfarin for um, three months with the help of steroids. That was how that challenge was overcome. Uh, after some time, after three, three or four months after the uh, this uh, incident, again, the platelets are dropping. Uh, I would like to tell this is the usual way the most of the ITP patients would behave. There will be multiple lines of treatment, multiple uh, 
admissions, hospital admissions, having bleeding episodes, and uh, the life will go on. That's why I call this living with low platelets. So the third line was commenced, um, immunosuppression presents available MMF cyclosporine tried um, one after the other, short-lived responses, and uh, she never had a sustained platelet count without bleeding episodes. Uh, at each point, uh, about uh, she was a uh, young lady. Uh, therefore, they have their advice regarding avoidance of pregnancy is well documented in the clinical records. Uh, by this time, she has had enough of everything. Uh, her quality of life was so much affected by the immunosuppressant about this uh, ongoing chronic disease process. Um, she wanted to withhold all the medications. Again, the discussions, proper documentation, and when symptomatic, uh, the management given, menorrhagia, uh, so was uh, uh, with the help of the gynecology team, she was managed with tranexamic acid, no um, And the watch and wait, even when the platelets are below 20,000, and uh, the plan was if there's a significant clinical bleed, immediately admit, uh, start on tranexamic acid, IV immunoglobulin, steroids, and if uh, a very severe bleed, platelet transfusion. Risk of bleeding explained to her. So now the life is becoming so troublesome for this lady. Are there any other options? She's coming with a significant uh, bleeding episode, a hematomesis with a platelet count of four. At this time, fortunately, thrombocytin receptor agonists were available in the hospital setup. Uh, what are the available uh, thrombocytin receptor agonists? From clostin, a subcut once weekly is the way it's given, an L thrombopack, an oral drug. A bit about these two uh, medication, uh, sub romiclostin, subcutaneous, once weekly, uh, indication in ITB patients who are refractory to other treatment. The initial dosing, uh, depending on the actual, actual body weight, how do we adjust the dose according to the platelet response? Uh, and after four weeks, we give the highest dose, no uh, response achieved, we are supposed to stop the medication. But the disadvantage, once we stop the medication, the thrombocytopenia would usually recur. Uh, this was tried in her. Did she have a response? Once again, no luck there. What are the options? If one TPO agonist fails, uh, there's a possibility to try the other one. Therefore, uh, l thrombopag was started, which is the oral option, which is the more convenient option. But this was uh, this option given to her earlier, but she did not want to swallow pills daily. That is the reason why the once weekly subcutaneous option was given, which failed. So, Eltromopac lowest dose is 50 milligrams per day. Uh, usually, they respond within one to two weeks. Once the drug is stopped, again, the response will be lost. Dose adjustment again, according to the platelet count. Uh, the Idea is not to normalize the count, but to maintain a safe platelet level. Uh, what are the disadvantage of both these drugs? The availability in our setting, it, uh, uh, romiclostine is not available. Eltromopat with donations, once in a while, we might be able to find the medication in the private sector, very costly, about uh, 700, uh, 5,000 5, 5, to 7,000 rupees per tablet. Uh, so, uh, coming back to the patient, Zara, finally responding to a medication. She was responding to l uh, through two months into treatment, maintaining a safe platelet count above 75,000. Uh, uh, and this was maintained for quite some time. Quality of life much improved. In case of failure of this line, what else to do? You can always add a immunosuppressant to the l and the future was planned in case uh, she does not respond to all of these. They had a plan. Uh, again, everything planned. And uh, the next line would be a surgical option because all the medical options would have planned, uh, failed by then. Uh, 
possibility of success versus failure because uh, even the splenectomy only about 80% would respond even uh, if they respond they can again relapse all this were explained there are surgical complications as well long-term prophylactic medications needed and vaccinations needed so after a long story, just summarizing uh, about a life story of a patient who has troublesome immune thrombocytopenia, initially diagnosed when she was 18 years uh, in 2010, then maintained stable counts for two years uh, without a much significant bleeding episode. Later in 2013, she had a troublesome bleed and then uh, went for the second line treatment, rituximab. Uh, she had to undergo major cardiac surgery and maintain uh, platelet counts while giving the uh, anticoagulation. Uh, then the third line options, cyclosporine as well as MMF given. Afterwards, she has refused everything, therefore watch and wait policy maintained. Uh, once again, relapse and thrombocytin receptor agonist finally responding to treatment. Future plan would be splenectomy if nothing would work for her. So application to our Sri Lankan clinical scenario, do we have all these, these things available for us to do in Sri Lanka? Of course, we do have all the first line treatment, the pregnisidone, dexamethasone, IV immunoglobulin, but IV immunoglobulin very costly. We have to be very careful when we prescribe this to the really needed patients. Uh, the second line options, rompostin and l thrombopath, as I earlier mentioned, l thrombopath very rarely with uh, very rarely we will get from uh, MSD or with donations, uh, very costly. Uh, other immunosuppressants, MMF, Dapsone, Cyclosporine, Astarapine, or the in our setting. Um, uh, other things uh, to uh, apply into our setting when managing these troublesome uh, chronic patients would be the multidisciplinary approaches, uh, the family discussions, and maybe the role of the clinical nurse specialist because uh, in these chronic patients, uh, this, uh, the nurses, the clinical nurse specialists do a really great job because they keep close contact with these patients, adhering to all other issues like psychological support, et cetera. These might be small things which we can uh, adhere, like um, incorporate into our clinical setting. Uh, these were my references and uh, once again, I would like to thank the um, Sri Lanka College of Physicians on behalf of the uh, hematologists for giving us this valuable opportunity. Hope this case might have uh, given few learning points when you manage your uh, outpatients, clinics, or the busy casualties. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jayasundra, for the a very uh, informative lecture on uh, the living with low platelet, uh, which is uh, not uncommon in a medical ward. So uh, this is uh, open for uh, any questions. Okay, so in the absence of the, any questions, uh, we will uh, conclude the uh, session on college lecture. So uh, thank you, Dr. Jayasundra. Uh, for the, uh, uh, again, uh, a very uh, excellent uh, presentation and uh, eye-opening lecture as well. So uh, you will be receiving an, uh, a certificate uh, which will uh, be shown on the screen. So all the, uh, the presenters today will receive the certificate in due course. And uh, thank you uh, for the Sri Lanka College of hematologist uh, for organizing uh, this uh, uh, lecture in collaboration with CCP. And uh, thank you for uh, the, all the participants, uh, judges and the presenters and uh, uh, the AV team, uh, Mr. Nalina and uh, the college staff uh, and the pre-intern and uh, Professor Arosha for his uh, time and uh, my co-secretary, uh, Dr. Dinesha. Uh, and thank you to Shara for organizing this uh, YPF uh, series. And thank you for George Stewart for sponsoring the college lecture. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.